Hero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escow. And joining us once again is our good friend, Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf is a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's a visiting professor at New York University, uh, author of a number of books, latest of which is The Sicknesses of the System and the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV. Uh, uh, without any further ado, I guess, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, RJ. Very glad to be here. Always good to have you. And I thought we would talk particularly since uh, I'm away from home for the first time in uh, God knows how long, a couple years, um, feels like, uh, uh, about leisure, real and artificial. And I think, uh, you know, we may have to roll, you know, lay that out for our audience, but I think you get a sense of when I talk about real versus artificial leisure, what we're talking about, right? Yes, I do. And it's a fascinating topic as much for how little attention is paid to it uh, and the gap between that and how absolutely crucial it is to our lives. It, it, it's remarkable. In, in Europe, they have a, a much more developed sense of it. It's called, particularly in Germany, but in other countries too, it's called the work-life balance uh, that's the phrase that they have over there. And it figures in every labor union negotiation with an employer. Uh, it is as important as how high a wage increase you do or do not demand, what other job conditions you wish to have changed. Uh, the, it is legitimate to put forward a demand having to do with, quote unquote, improving the work-life balance. And a lot of that turns out to be, and you can read it in the union discussions and you can read it in some of the journalistic coverage there, it turns out to have in it a basic notion that human beings work, they understand work and labor and all of that, but it's only a part of life. Your relationships with your family, your relationships with your friends, your relationships in your community are all important dimensions that take time, that take energy, that take uh, the quality of your life, the schedule you live by. And employers may only care about you as a workhorse, but you don't. And there is there has to be a compromise or an agreement of some sort between the employer who just cares about your work and you who care about all that the word life means. And that includes time off to develop your brain, to develop your feelings, to engage in your relationships. I mean, it is tragic that we do not have that built into our culture uh, the way it ought to be. Well, and I have a couple thoughts about that, uh, as I am wont to do from time to time. Number one, I was thinking as you were speaking of my friend Jimmy, who was a bartender. Jimmy was a bartender, and he'd go to parties, and people would say, what do you do? You know, and these would be doctors and lawyers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, you know, he wasn't ashamed of being a bartender. It is a noble profession, in fact, but uh, and he knew that. But they'd say, what do you do, Jimmy? And he'd say, about what? <laughs> and to me, that points to uh, the fact that in so many segments of our society in particular, people define themselves by their profession or their source of income, and uh, which does a couple of the years. It's fine if you're, you know poet or whatever i mean it's fine in any case that's what you feel is fundamental about you but not everybody has that relationship to work and it seems to me that this may be a fairly recent historical phenomenon where uh that's number every form you fill out you say you know you're pipe fitter you a brain surgeon you what do you do and uh it seems to me that this sort of 
casting ourselves obviously the professional classes play a different role the managerial classes play a different role but it seems to me like in every segment of society your definition of self starts out with how you obtain money from the economic system do you get what i'm driving at yeah and i think what that's doing uh is reducing you to the usefulness or not that you have for some employer who will because of whatever calculation the employer makes find you to be an important cog in the machinery and therefore pay you a lot or find you a minor detail producer and pay you a little and somehow how and where you fit into the profit driven objectives of your employer become your self definition it is it, it, it's awful it, it is a way of reducing the complexity <coughs> excuse me that every human being is to to that person's functional usefulness to a profit making operation it it in that way it is really terrible it, it is a denial that all the other parts of you are what make you a unique human being with the ability to contribute thoughts and ideas and artistic creativity and a thousand other things all of which are set aside made marginal or secondary it's very sad and, and it costs people a great deal even if they're not aware consciously of what it is doing to them to be evaluated in that way and it strikes me that you know if we think about as as we so often come to in our conversations which we about the rise of capitalism the industrial revolution people's roles being changed particularly as fact factories arose mills and so on uh to more explicitly to production units and that sort of thing i think often of uh of the social critic and art critic john ruskin during that period in england writing you know using the gendered language of the time writing you can make a tool of the creature or you can make a man of him but you cannot do both that you know that he was standing i think of ruskin is standing at this kind of crossroads where like are we going to be instrumentalities of this new uh, machinery of capitalism or are we going to be fully realized human beings and it seems to me we took the instru the the instru the tool road rather than the right. human being road you got uh you get what i'm saying right Yes, and <clears throat> I think the link with capitalism is crucial uh, for people to understand what is going on. And, and the way I tell it is, is, it's a little parable, but I think it gets at the core of what we're talking about. Imagine <clears throat> in any capitalist society at any time that a new technique or, or a new invention comes down the road and it allows workers doing something it doesn't matter what it is making hamburgers making chairs making software programs whatever it is it allows those workers to be with this new equipment or machinery twice as productive as they were before now let's watch how capitalism deals with how it absorbs how it makes use of the new technology the capitalist says to half his labor force, you are fired. It's Friday afternoon. Here's your check. Don't come back Monday morning. Why? Because with half the workers starting Monday and the new machines installed over the weekend, half the workers can produce the same output next week as was produced this week generating the same revenue to our capitalist employer because he's selling the same quantity of goods but the joy of the capitalist employer is that with the revenue he gets from say uh, selling the same amount of goods he has only half the labor force to pay wages to the other half he keeps as the additional profit from his enterprise he's overjoyed 
and we have incorporated a technology. All right, now let's watch if it weren't capitalism. Let's suppose it was a worker co-op, just for the sake of argument. They also learned about the new machine. They also learned it made every worker twice as productive. What would the worker co-op do? Here's the alternative. If they understood what we just finished talking about, a work-life balance, if it was just as important for them as it ought to be, all of the other things they could be doing in their time, here's what they would do. They would say every worker stays on the job, gets the same wage next week as this week, but everybody works four hours a day instead of eight hours a day. The same quantity of goods will be produced. The capitalist employer can sell them. He can keep the same profit he did before, pay the workers the same wages as he did before. Everybody is either equally well off or in the case of the workers, their wages haven't gone up, but they have half their life, their work life back to to spend time with their children, to spend time with their artwork, to spend time on the social projects that engage their enthusiasm. It is a transformation of their lives, probably worth much more to them than the extra wage. And nobody has lost their job, and nobody is desperate because of it. It's a much better way. And if you believe in democracy, well, then giving the mass of people half of their work life back is way more democratically uh, organized than to give a, a, an employer, one or a handful of people, a big increase in the profits. So if you were democratic, if you understood what leisure really means, time off, the precious time, then that would be the way we would have instituted technological progress for the last 300 years. Instead, we have the following irony. Long ago, we made the 40-hour week a maximum. But the majority of workers today work more than 40 hours a week because they have to to keep their jobs, whether it's legal or illegal or on the edge between them, is really a secondary point. The technology that was supposed to free us from the drudgery of labor has not done so. It's denied us and thereby made a kind of mockery of the whole idea of real time off, real leisure, because it has been used to enhance profits, not to enhance the work-life balance. And it seems to me the flip side of everything you're describing is the fact that we've put American workers uh, in a state of perpetual anxiety. So that you mentioned, and I think it's important, I want to get back to people, do people really understand what true leisure is? I want to talk about that more. But uh, it seems to me that even in an example where people had the opportunity to work half as many hours per day, four instead of eight, if overall people are perceived correctly that you know they can't get health care they might you know might get cancer and have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars whatever it is so many people feel which is perfect this is perfect from the uh, exploiter uh, employer's point of view if people are constantly in a state of fear precarity then you know no, no i'll get another job i'll fill the time however i can which i would argue enacts an enormous invisible cost on human beings but it seems to me we also have to help people understand that it doesn't have to be that way on a broad on a more macro scale yeah and that's why i tell that story i mean there are options that could have enhanced our leisure and by the way that's true of the whole idea which is constantly undermined in this country of providing what can be called collective consumption so that you don't have 
to solve the problem of access to the good things of life always with an independent individual expenditure. I mean, most Americans live in cities, and mo most of those cities maintain, in one way or another, a public park. There you can go with your family, throw a blanket down on the lawn, have a picnic, enjoy your children, get together with friends, and you don't have to spend any money because it is a collectively maintained facility. It's there whether you use it or not. It's clean. The shrubbery is attended to. The flowers are put in uh, periodically. Uh, all the rest of it. These are these are signs to us. If we had health care provided as a public service like our parks, if we had child care provided as a public, we wouldn't be placing our individuals in the position of anxiety and fear you just described. And it would allow them then to use their leisure freely to really develop their relationships, to develop what real leisure allows you to explore, which in the end is yourself. We don't know all the capacities we have. We don't know all the pleasures awaiting us out there. How about we have, you know, craft centers where you can go, maintained by the community, and you can indulge me, make pots, uh, carve things, paint things. You know, many years ago when I first started going to Europe, I was amazed at how many uh, small towns in France had a community center, which, by the way, they called sports palaces, even though they weren't limited to sports, you could go there and there was swimming pools and it was in every town was considered a social service. It was a community center. You could learn to craft. You could learn that you could meet people for reading if you wanted to read poetry together, all kinds. And they were there. And in the winter, the rooms were warm and in the in the summer they were air conditioned the community created opportunities to explore your own personality your own interests to discover new ones and make new friendships all of this was considered a part of the community's obligation every bit as important as the job and the income that the job represented now, partly this is a leftover from feudalism. You know, capitalism in Europe was born in opposition to a feudal past. And here in the United States, we don't have a feudal past. We didn't have to struggle out of a feudal past because when the Europeans came here, <clears throat> they wiped out the local population, as we all know, and simply got to work doing the capitalism with many fewer of the old influences you know that, that come from a different system that isn't driven by profit in the way that competitive capitalism always has been and that's one of the reasons why you get the absurd pressure on the worker you must work harder you must work longer the minute i can replace you with a machine i will and that means those of you that are left will have to work even harder to make up for what the people I fired were doing because the machine might not do it all quite so well, et cetera, et cetera. That constant pressure for profit, you know, it does it generate economic growth? Yes. But what we don't understand in capitalism, and it is coming to home to roost right, right now, is the enormous cost. You know, I find it ironic in a sad sort of way that even though more and more Americans are beginning to understand that profit-driven capitalism enabled economic growth, but at a cost to nature, a cost to the environment, a cost to our climate that literally can destroy us, haven't yet wrapped their heads around the fact that the biggest cost isn't actually the horrible cost of environmental degradation. 
It's the horrible cost of human degradation. By not providing the facilities and the leisure, how many geniuses were unable to make the contributions of which they were capable to develop the capacities that they had? It's the same critique we make of our school system, that because you, you're, you're cheap and you won't raise taxes on corporations and the rich to fund the proper educational system, you are losing contributions that could have transformed us. Capitalism is not an efficient system. It never was. That's mere boasting. And it wants you to look only at how many objects are stored in our garage. That's not the only measure of a economic system success. The Europeans are far ahead of us by saying, no, no, it's the work-life balance that we want to talk about, not just our contribution to the mountain of goods and services we don't even know how to get rid of in our overloaded garbage dumps. And that gets me to uh, you know, the, the undiscovered country that is genuine leisure, right? That, that, that I think has been kept a secret from people in a sense, because, you know, and I know that there's a lot of, you know, Marx has written about this. A lot of people have written about, you know, various theories of, uh, of artificial alienated leisure and these types of things. There seems to me there's a lot of truth to that, that leisure for a lot of working people. And I don't say that with any judgment towards them because this is the world as it's been presented to them, but it becomes another source of stress because it has to involve consumption consumption of fuel consumption of money consumption of you know buy a boat you know i mean I, I i'm here in the countryside where people you know who with very modest houses have expensive boats in the driveway maybe they took out a loan and you know it's easy whatever it is big trucks that that or just go 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 be somewhere you know that you pack the family in the van and everybody's the kids are complaining and you're driving for eight hours and whatnot that um which is how our family vacations used to be but the notion of genuine and, and this is all very alienated this is all commodified this is all things that can be measured by people in your profession economists you know consumption of fuel consumption of resources that kind of thing but you know people have not had the opportunity to understand the gratification of walking, like you say, in a nearby park or learning to paint. or And it seems to me that our culture is just suffused. And I grew up in it. I mean, I understand it with a sense that those are indulgences that to even do those things, especially what me learn to paint, you know, I got work to do, you know, that we don't understand how much that adds and that the intangible would never, nevertheless, profoundly real value of that needs to be rediscovered i don't know what do you think yeah but I, you know you know me and you know where i'm gonna go with this but i'm a critic of capitalism and 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 for these kinds of reasons on the one hand the the profit system makes you nervous about your security of your job and your income when we wouldn't need to be if we were rational about this it abuses every new technology simply to enhance profit at the expense of people's leisure. But it doesn't stop there. If you understand capitalism, you know that every producer of every commodity is constantly dependent to survive on selling whatever the hell that producer makes. Therefore, we have entire industries, we call it advertising, whose job it is to sell, 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 find anything about a human being that you can and use it to get them to part with money to buy whatever your, the, your client asks uh, you to advertise. So, of course, people who have leisure, more of it or less of it, are constantly bombarded with a capitalist-driven advertising you really want to relax 
You need to do it this way, by this object, by that boat, by that gizmo for your backyard, by the, by the, by this. It, it never, ever stops. It works on you. It works on your spouse. It works on your children. It works on your neighbors. Of course, you then end up spending. And that, of course, means your income is being stretched, which means you have have to borrow, which means instead of leisure being the antidote to anxiety, it becomes another stimulant to that anxiety. I mean, it's so sad to watch. So sad. Yeah, of course, spending an afternoon in a pretty meadow in some park or some rural or some suburban out with people you like develops a relationship. You talk to each other. Other. You look at each other. You begin to be friends on a different level. This is infinitely more important to your well-being, physical and mental, than getting on the water skis to do that again with the expensive boat or, you know, all, all the other things that are money making. It's a pathetic demonstration, you know, in economics, because I don't want you to have a, a risk respect for this profession beyond what it deserves, and it doesn't deserve very much. In economics, you count it as a plus. If you can fill people's leisure with objects that they buy, which therefore give jobs to people to produce those objects, which therefore generate profit for the companies that produce those objects, you are counting your economy as going up. People are producing, goods are being made, profits are being gotten, and that's a plus in economics. Why? Is it a plus? Really? Not, of course not, because no one counts the negatives. The lost leisure, the lost relaxation time, the lost opportunity to do the kinds of things that a community that provided collective consumption of leisure-type activities could have enabled all kinds of people to take advantage of. No one counts it. So, so it's like you have a plus and a minus, but the profession erases all the minuses and says, see what a plus it is. GDP went up. No. That's a society that will have more and more GDP until it falls off the cliff of its own internal degradation. We can see it now with the climate. We should see it with this whole issue of work-life balance and the kind of leisure that develops you as a complicated human being. Then you don't have to find substitutes for the love, the friendship, the loyalty, the solidarity that you look for it and find so hard to locate in your own life. So two quotes come to mind. Richard, well, maybe, you know, so that we can conclude. And Troy, uh, producer Troy, get your uh, pen out because you're going to have to ble bleep one of them. One of them is from the, first of all, I want to note that I too am a critic of capitalism, perhaps yes. not as an experienced or informed uh, one as you, but it, well, I know, I know that. Our, our, right. I really do know that because that's why our conversations are as as productive as they have been. And, and, and I see that and, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, as am I. And, uh, you know, I, I think of the poet Robinson Jeffers, who wrote once uh, of the people, you know, I think we would characterize as capitalists, they'd shit on the morning star if they could reach it. Uh, uh, which gets me my second quote, which is, you know, they used to say the devil's greatest trick was convincing you he doesn't exist. And to me, those two quotes des describe the cohort of people we're resisting in order to build a, a new society, a better society. And to me, it's a question of how to get through to people that, you know, you think your enemy is wokeism or whatever that you think that is or whatever they've told you it is. Uh, and that really, no, you're up against a system that wants to bleed you dry, that's vampiric. And, um, you know, just 
leisure to me is one dimension of that conversation. You're being robbed of something that you don't even know is as precious as it is, I guess I would say. You know, if I could add one thing, I forgot to say when I was talking about Europe. And Europe, of course, has its own problems. But in most European countries, they don't have a 40-hour week. They have a 35, a 37. I, I mean, for them, that was part of what the labor movement was supposed to do. It wasn't. There's nothing magical about the number 40. And if you can be asked to work harder and be more productive, Productive, which European workers are, then the workers in turn demand we want more leisure too. In other words, we want to share in the form of leisure any rising productivity. It is not something that goes only to the profit calculation because that's what, you know, and those who are socialists among the labor movement in Europe, which is most of them, they know what they're saying. They want to go in toward a society where automation gives real leisure to most people most of the time, which was always the promise of technological progress, but it was a promise never delivered. Well, our next conversation, unless you disagree, perhaps it should be about defining progress, because when the work week went from 60 hours to 40 hours, we called it progress. We thought, well, the logical next step in progress, 30 hours a week. Somehow, right. The concept of progress itself has been hijacked, just like the con concept of... Good idea. Good yeah. idea. Right. Let's go. But for now, we are indeed out of time. So as always, Professor Richard Wolf, thank you so much for your time and your insights. It's been a pleasure speaking. Same here. And I look forward to getting together to continue. As do I. And the audience, you and I will get together in a minute. Uh, Richard R.J. Estow, and this is The Zero Hour.